So let me go ahead and get started here. So Stu, it is, you know, we did, we spoke, I think it was about 13 years ago for my book, and we did a, that TV show together. And I just, as then, as now, it is such an honor and a privilege always to be in your presence. You've always been such a great friend. And what you've done to the sport, it's, uh, you're one of the greatest icons ever. So well, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I really don't understand or look at it that way myself. I don't. Uh, I just did what I did because I enjoyed doing it. Same thing, my feelings about when I flew in the Navy. Uh, it just happened. And uh, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. Having flown off of carrier decks, supersonic airplanes, and, and so on. I look back on it now and it seems like a dream. Well, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I've got to mention you're going to be 90 years old here this uh, this May. We're going to have a big celebration at the Chica Lodge, and you know, all of your friends uh, are going to be I there. I hope you're going to be there. Oh, I, I wouldn't miss it for the world. Fantastic. And my you know, son Nikki too. Great. Do you remember fishing with us when we did the show uh, Sportsman's Journal, the show that I was producing and, and hosting? We had you on the show all those years ago. Uh, what do you remember from that show? Well, I remember a bunch of things. I remember losing a fish, but I remember uh, you standing on the console barefoot while we were chasing a tarpon that ran out over 300 yards of backing. <laughs> and and it was a rough day, windy, and you're balancing yourself barefoot with your prehensile toes on the on the polling platform on the casting platform no it wasn't it was on the console on the console on top of the console well i had, I had great training for balance on you know skiing down a ribbon of ice at 100 so that was actually a i've never fallen off those things before but i was wondering i'm i might fall off one day so i'm not doing that any longer but um you i think initially I think you're known mostly, you know, not only for being an all-around great angler and all the records that you caught, but mostly um, your 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 tarpon expertise and chasing the big fish. And don't you agree, or do you think wasn't that where your heart was more more pulled by by tarpon than any other fish? Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, what other fish would you find in shallow water? Spot fish you know, casting a fly to them, watch them turn, eat the fly, and then have them fight the way they do and jump. And they're just a great all-around fish. My favorite. It's like the perfect tarpon fish. I mean, excuse me, the perfect fly fish. They are. They are. Well, let's go back to Miami in the early years. Um, what about your, your childhood years? You know, what was it like growing up in Miami? Well, of course, Miami, as I call it. right. Was, so almost like the snook, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that's what Flip calls him. Yeah, right. I call him snook. He calls him snook. Right. <laughs> uh, Miami back then was a, a lazy town of less than 10,000 people back in the 1930s. And now it's over 2.5 million people in the Miami area. Period. It's scary to uh, even drive through that area. Oh, I don't like to go up there at all. And of course, I was born there in 1930. Uh, my, my claim to fame was having been the first baby born in Jackson Memorial Hospital, which back then was a wooden structure. Oh, wow. Uh, the first baby born on Mother's Day, 1930. Wow, we're going back some time. But you didn't grow up with any money. You, you didn't have hardly anything. I mean, I'm reading about you with hand lines, and a sinker was like a bolt or a washer from a, you know. Exactly. As such. Tell me about how you made that, that I would say, that transition from hand lining to actually being able to, to go fishing. And, you know, when was it that you really had that light go, you know, to a brighter color, like, this is what I want to do. I am a fisherman. You know, I used to read Philip Wiley's books about Captain Crunch and Disc, his mate. Uh, fish and tin, I have these books. And Fish and Tin Fish and the Big Ones Get Away. And all of these happenings, and I used to think, gosh, one time if I could ever get out on a boat like that. And that was my dream when I was 
11, 12, 13 years old. You always wanted to be a fisherman, even oh. before you were a fisherman. Well, no, I was a fisherman in my next door neighbor's fishing goldfish pond. Right. Uh, I used to sneak in there, and that was my start, really. So that's when you knew. And then we, we were living in, in rental apartments back then. And we had to move from one to the other and so on because of, of the, con- the financial conditions. And we moved to one that was very close to the Miami River. And I used to sneak out and go down to the river with bent pin, thread, and dough balls and catch shiners. And every once in a while, these big fish would grab my shiner and break my thread. And they were tarpon and snook. You know, I didn't know at the time. But I got you even. You just knew there was a big beast in the dark abyss. I got that was even with them. <laughs> yeah, you did. Um, how'd you get to the Keys? My next door neighbor in Miami in 1940, my parents uh, built a house in 1940 in Miami, their first that they owned themselves. And my next door neighbor was a retired Texas Ranger. And, uh, also a retired, well, he was still the chief steward at Hylia Park, and he was a judge at Tropical Park, and he was a handicapper for the Gimbel's brothers of note. And I remember one day uh, this limo pulls up with another car to my next-door neighbor, and they were giving him a limousine as a present, which was nice. But Bud James, his name, true name was S.L. James. Everybody called him Bud. Bud James and his wife were bait casters and, and true fishermen, outdoors people, hunters. Uh, they used to want to take me duck hunting, and my parents wouldn't let me, my mother wouldn't let me go. Too dangerous. But I used to go into the 10,000 Islands with Bud, and he gave me my first real good fishing rod, and it was a a uh, five and a half foot long bait casting outfit, split bamboo with a Shakespeare superior reel in black nylon line, 15 pound test, and taught me how to use that. And that became my, my weapon for many years. Still is. Interesting. Was your mom nervous a lot? I mean, did you give her reason to worry? Because you named your boat Mom's Worry. Was it based on your mom's apprehension of, of just being nervous about her son, or did you give her reason to be nervous? Mm, well, mom's worry came about because my dad said that. That happened when I ejected out of a Panther jet that blew up, put me in the hospital for a while. And uh, after I was able to, I got on the telephone. I was flying Panther jets at the time. Got on the telephone with my dad and uh, told him that I'm, I'm fine and what happened and so on. He said, son, I want you to know you're really your mom's worry. Because I had lied to her. I told her I was flying multi-engine patrol planes in the Navy, not a, fi- not a single-engine fighter plane, which is what I was flying. What was that like? It was great. I can't even imagine being in one of those jets. Oh, great. But, you know, uh, carrier flying uh, is the height and precision flying, coming back aboard. Uh, I, what, I forgot how many years ago it was, probably, I'd have to holler to Janine to find out, when we went up to, my first duty station was Naval Air Station, Oceana, Virginia, and I was in Fighter Squadron VF-81, and we went back there to do a, uh, a fundraiser for wounded warriors, and they found out that I had been based there before, and the big newspaper for Virginia, the Virginia Pilot, uh, called me and interviewed me on the telephone. And they ran this big spread about that, my being there and so on, my coming up. Well, we got there, and the Admiral, that, that, that's the biggest fighter base in the world now. When I was there, it was a Naval Auxiliary Air Station. Interesting. <laughs> and we had Quonset huts that we worked out of. Now it's all big multi-story concrete buildings and so on. Uh, anyway, uh, they, this admiral 
Got a lieutenant commander. It is actually 1245, <laughs> December 5th, 2019. They uh, assigned a lieutenant commander who was one of the uh, Super Hornet, which was the air, still the airplane now of, of the future uh, instructor out there to me to squire me around the base for the day and gave a lieutenant who was a uh, instructor to, to my wife to take her around. Well, one of the things we did is I got into the cockpit on a number of these different airplanes and it felt pretty good. Uh, he said, you know, we have a simulator, a Super Hornet simulator free right now uh, for a little while if you'd like to do that. I said, oh, I would love that. Well, last airplane I flew was 1985. That was a 747 as a captain for Pan Am. Uh, but I got in this... <laughs> in the simulator. Simulator. And uh, they... I, they said, well, you, you, you showed me all the different controls and so on. If I could have sat in that cockpit for a couple of hours and just knew where everything was, and so, it would have been much, much, much better. But I did a, an afterburner takeoff, climbed out to where the supercarrier was offshore. Janine was in the back of all that. She could see what, what I was doing on the screen. And it was very interesting. Fascinating. Uh, I made a carrier break, uh, came back around, dropped my gear and tail hook and so on. And right at the very last moment, uh, I knew, I thought that I was a little bit too high and a little bit too fast to, to hit the deck. So I went around. And I figured I could come back around now and do it again. It'd be much easier for me. The actual carrier landings nowadays i think on these big canada deck carriers are much better much easier than even with the high performance uh, uh, supersonic airplanes than it used to be with the non canada deck carriers where you had to take a cut and that was it if you were too slow you'd hit the back of the carrier too fast, you'd bounce off the other side, and that was it. I mean, you you had a do or die situation every time. Did you have any close calls? No, my carrier. Back in the day, my carrier. I'd had 120, 121 carrier landings. We call them traps, right? Nowadays, but then you flew for Pan Am, and that gave you access to the world. You could fish elsewhere and always gravitate back to the keys that was the reason i went with pan am i was offered much much better deals with other airlines united uh was really hounding me uh in american airlines i would have been a captain 10 or 12 years sooner with them than i was with pan am i had 17 years 16 or 17 years as a co-pilot with pan am waiting my turn on the seniority list, because Pan Am wasn't expanding back then. Right. Uh, my check out as a captain was one of the greatest things with Pan Am. Because then you made that transition from being a professional pilot to what? Guiding. A professional pilot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, tell me about that. Uh, those early years in the Keys, a little torch, you know, how you built your clientele in the boat, mom's worry and, uh, you know, Joe Brooks, Ted Williams and all these celebrities. Well, Joe Brooks was my mentor from the time I was 16 years old. And I had set a Metropolitan Miami fishing tournament, which Joe was the, uh, the, uh, manager of it, I guess you'd call it. Mm -hmm. And I caught a Jack Cravel on a old, nasty, three-piece split bamboo rod in a reel without a drag. That became the tournament record. And it was a 17-pound, some-odd-ounce Jack Cravel, which was a hell of a fish. Uh, Joe Brooks was at the prize presentation, made the presentation to me, and we ended up talking, 
And they asked me to go fish if I wanted to go fishing. Well, of course, I always wanted to go fishing. Still do. Uh, and Joe and I went to Key Largo. Uh, and we waited for bonefish. And Joe was truly my mentor. He was Lefty Cray's mentor also, you know. Right, right. Uh, Joe would give of himself to people. It's quite a story about Joe Brooks, you know. Uh, he was an alcoholic. And he, Mary, his wife, pulled him out of that. And that was a, a great thing. I used to do things with Joe in, in Montana. Joe was the reason I went to Montana. He would call me two or three times a year when he would be out there and say, Stu, you just got to come out here and trout fish with me. And I'd say, say, once you get here, it won't cost you anything. You stay with me and Mary. And I'd say, Joe, if I'm going to cast a fly to a fish, it won't be some piddling trout like that. And he'd say, Stu, you just don't understand. And he was right. Right. I finally went out there on a one-year belated honeymoon in 1962. And uh, that was my introduction to trout fishing. And you've always had a presence out there all these years, Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. I've, I've only not been there one year. So what one. does Montana do for you, a Florida tarpon guy? Uh, I'm a skier from Colorado. I know what trout fishing does for me. What does trout fishing in, in the mountains do for you? Uh, it's completely different from saltwater fly fishing, which is speed and accuracy and uh, really... Uh, important to do the right thing because if you you screw up on that fish chances are that fish will be in the next time zone and you'll never see that same fish again in the same place whereas trout fishing if you put the trout down and you sit down and eat a sandwich that same trout if there's a hatch coming off will be rising right in the same place again didn't go anywhere right so you had to be gentle you had to be uh your casting had to be much better Right. Different you, kind. You know, you may feel the same as I. When I'm in Colorado, I don't feel the urgency to fish hard in long hours like I do when I'm in the Keys. Like a lot of days, I'll go to the river, and I love just the sound of the water, watching the tumbling current and the birds flying and the greenery and the, and the clear skies. And I love to watch the river marinate. I love to watch the hatch start to build. And I'll smoke a cigar or, or sit on the bank and just enjoy that warm spring sunshine. I'll go out in March to ski for maybe, you know, 10 days or so. I'll go up early with my son, ski for a couple hours, and then go to the river. And usually you'll have a betas hatch of some kind coming off later in the afternoon, maybe a blue-winged olive. And I just love to sit on the bank and watch and listen. And I'm sure that you probably feel the same up in Montana. Different. Different, you know, it is, I don't have the urgency. Right. It's I don't one feel, thing. Right. But uh, it's the ambiance right. of the whole scene of what you're doing, and you're doing it differently and nicely. And it's it's a learning process all over again. For sure. Believe me. Uh, that's one of, the advantage, one of the advantages and niceties of fly fishing. You, there's never a day out there I don't learn something. I try. Tell me about the uh, turbo-filled adrenaline days of chasing tarpon, S flying in skiffs. Who cares about a sunrise? And you can't wait to see that first fish roll or bloop or start to come down the, an edge. You're right. You've been there, so you know. And uh, it is a fantastic feeling, uh, one that's hard to even talk about sometimes. Uh, you know, the Quest for Giant Tarpon video that I did sure shows that well. It was with... Uh, you and Rick Murphy <clears throat> yep. in Home Assassin. Yep. I watched it a thousand and, times. And, uh, you know, the early opening at uh, daybreak, the tarpon coming up and blooping around, you know, and these were big fish and lots of them back then. I guess it's coming back again some now. I heard it's, get, it's gotten better. There was an article in this latest Saltwater Sportsman or Florida, I guess Florida Sportsman magazine by Frank Sargent. I have it. A friend of mine uh, 
store it somewhere. I don't get it anymore, but brought it over to me. And uh, Frank does a good job. He's a hell of a good writer. And he has a great uh, TV uh, happening that he does. It's not a show. It's a, a program that you you check, you buy into. And every every day they come out with new things. Pretty interesting. It is. Um, it's interesting, too, to see uh, what they've, you know, as far as the habitat, we'll get into that maybe a little bit later, maybe not, but the, the salinity was too high, the lack of fresh water over there, the big fish moved out, the bait uh, was gone, and now, you know, they're starting to see a few more fish over there. So it's, it's interesting to see and, and speak with guys like Tom Evans that are still over there fishing, and they're seeing some fish, um, and there are some different kind of issues over there now, but at least we know that there, it's... There are some fish there, and there are some big ones. Tom Evans is a great big fish fighter and fisherman. Is he, is he possibly uh, a guy that you had respected and held in high esteem? Yes, definitely. <clears throat> who was, the, who was the, the number one guy you most feared catching that 200-pound you know, uh, holy grail fish other than yourself? Most feared? I don't... Well, you know, as a competitor, let's just say you're going to go into a ski race. I knew, or a fishing tournament, I knew there was going to be one angler or one guide that I had the utmost respect for because I knew that they most likely will be able to catch that fish sooner than I or as quickly as I. So when you go to home assassin in the early years, you had Billy Pate, you had yourself, you had Tom Evans, and some of the gang, you know, Clyde Balk was over there for a number of years. Yep. Who did you respect the most? Matter of fact, he knocked off my 12-pound record for a while. Yeah. So who who among those guys did you respect the most? They were all very respected, you know. I, I did. I, I, I'm not going to pick out names there. Uh, I could pick out guides. Who was your favorite guide that you most respected? Well, it would be a combination between Rick Murphy in Ralph Delph. Uh, you know, I, I broke the record on 12 pound twice in one day with Ralph Delph over there. And Ralph was probably the best all around inshore, offshore guide there ever was. He had had more than 400 uh, in some odd world records caught with him. More than 400. Right. I've heard that a lot from a lot of different people about but Delphi. Ralphie Delphi was a mechanical engineer. We were neighbors in Miami, and he was a block away from me in the subdivision. And uh, we would get together and fish and so on, and he would just complain about his being in the office and his job. i say, Ralph, you know, you fish so good on the in uh, flats fishing, you ought to chuck that job and be a, a guide, a fishing guide. And he said, you really think I can make a living? I think you could do excellent. And he did. And uh, Ralph and I would take turns at home assassin fishing, polling. And when I hooked the biggest fish I've ever had. With Ralph. With Ralph, that's F right. Famous fish. Yep. Well, it took Ralph out of the boat twice yeah tell me the story tell me about you know casting this fish how you saw it, what did you see the bite tell, talk let's talk about the, the the war that was waged well there were a lot of boats around homosassa at that time in the area that all the boats were uh there were fish but ralph and i said you know let's get the hell out of here and go find another place and find some fish that don't have all these boats boogering them and which was, was happening now. There were, Billy Pate had four outboards, four electric trolling motors on his boat, and you could hear him coming from a half a mile away with those, you yeah. know, these were electrics. That's not how you were supposed to use them. Right. But he did. So we fired up and left the area and went north. And yeah, it'd be north up to another area, and we got there, and there was one other boat there, and it was Steve Huff. And we checked in with him, and he said, yeah, there's a few fish here, there, 
we, we had our own codes on the radio. And uh, so we started fishing. Actually, we'll wait one second here. We get the 12 o'clock, <laughs> 1 p.m. One p.m. ringer. Yeah, well, anyway, no, it's going to chime every 15 minutes, too. Well, um, so anyway, you go north, you see Steve, you're communicating with Steve, trying to find some fish away from all these boats. Yep, and uh, we were in about eight feet, or seven, eight feet of water, and there was a daisy chain that Ralph picked up way off. Saw a couple of fish blurp, and we pull over to them. And uh, they're in a fairly good daisy chain going around clockwise. How many fish are you talking now? Oh, probably 25, 30 fish, all big fish. And there was one fish in the middle. That was a humongous fish. Big fish. And uh, I fish a minimum of a 12-foot leader on this fishing. So I can make a cast across some of the fish with the leader and not bother them and get the fly to where I want it, to other fish. Well, this big fish turned to the fly and then a smaller fish, about 150 pounds, grabbed it and I went set to hook. I just let it be. And uh, it wasn't the one I wanted. And it really took a happening to do that because it was a good fish that did it anyway, but not that humongous fish. And it blew the fly out and uh, disturbed the other fish. And they broke up the chain. And they swam off in a string uh, for about maybe a couple of hundred yards and chained up again. And Ralph pulled me back over there again. My leader was okay because I, didn't, I never set the hook on him. And I did the same thing cast across some of the fish to get to the big one, and she ate it, and I set up on it. Uh, I was fishing a fiberglass uh, nine-foot rod, 12 weight, or 12, 13, you might say, but it was la labeled as a 12 weight. Set up on that fish, and it came out of the water like a Polaris missile, eight feet long, and it went straight up in the air. That was the only jump it made. And Ralph said, God, that's the one we want. And uh, it took off on a run. Never jumped again. We called Steve on the radio, Ralph did, and said, Steve, we've got the one we're looking for, or everyone's looking for. We may have to fire up. He said, don't worry about it. I saw it. It's a monster. Go get him. And that was Steve Huff talking. And uh, we did. We went after the fish. And... Ralph said it's the only time afterwards that he's ever said to anybody, take it easy. You don't, don't, don't take it easy. And I, you're pulling so hard. I'm, he was yeah, afraid I'm, you're going to break I'm this I'm right up on off. max 12 pound on my pull. I mean, I was so used to knowing how much you could put on him. You break a few off doing that, but I was right on it. Anyway, uh, 40 minutes into the fight. And this is 12-pound test. 12-pound test. 12-pound class. Right. Had to break 12 or under. That's right. Uh, we, 40 minutes into the fight, we get the fish in the boat together. And I started timing when this fish would come up and roll. And I said, you know... Uh, when this fish comes up the roll, I'm going to try and hold it up a time or two and see what happens. And it would struggle and go back down. And finally, I said, Ralph, I think the next time I can hold that fish up for you to gaff, you can sit, stand right here in the boat, not up on the bow, but inside the boat, and, and hit him. We had an eight-foot overall length kill gaff. I had a special one that I made myself from a flying gaff, tuna flying gaff that was big, big enough for these big fish. And I made it on a fiberglass handle. And I mean, it was forever. Uh, and Ralph said, no, I got my gaff that I use all the time in Key West. It's a, on an aluminum handle and a much smaller bite on the, on the hook. But 
we get the fish and boat together, and I'm holding it up there, and Ralph reaches out and gaffs it across the back. And that quickly, big Ralph Delph is in the water. Took him right over the gunnel in the water. And uh, he's still on the gaff, and he's got one hand on the gunnel holding on, the other half on the gaff, and he's handing the gaff up to me. He says, Stu, here, take it. Get, get it so I can get in the boat. And I've got the handle. And he gets in the boat, and the gaff didn't pull out, but it ripped out because it didn't have enough of a bite. That fish was so wide across the back, you know, that he only had a piece of it with that gaff. Gets in, in the boat, and we, the fish takes off. We go after the fish again. About 15, 20 minutes later, we get a shot again. And I said, Ralph, please use my gaff. <laughs> he said, no, no, I'm going to use my own. I know. And he did. And he gaffed that fish again. And later on, he said, well, the fish took him out of the boat a second time. And he, later on, he said, well, I went with it because I didn't want, the, want it to pull out. Uh, he, right. Yeah. But that fish swam off about 50 yards with Ralph in tow. And now we're in eight feet of water, and Ralph's got his arms and legs wrapped around that tarpon and trying to hold that short, that small gaff hook in the fish. And it looks like he's in, in the rolling down and under in eight feet of water. Looks like he was in trouble. So I dropped his engine. Oh, the engine was down. And I fired it up and went after the fish, after Ralph. I had a big release gaff, big hook that I had specially for, for that. And I was going to run up on the bow and hook that fish up under the, under the gill, under the chin. And uh, as I get up on it, I put what I thought, we were in Ralph's boat, weird throttle, throttle quadrant. And I put it what I thought was neutral and went up on the bow, and now we're still in idle forward. So I had to run back, put it in hard reverse, and turn off the key. <laughs> and, and I ran back up there, and now I had him boresighted, and the stem of the boat came over him and the fish, Ralph took one arm off the fish and... To stop the boat. Fended, no, to fend the, off the boat. Right. And it, it took him and, and the fish underwater, and the gaff came out, oh. and the fish swam off. I had run over the line going to him, oh. and, yeah, and the fish got off and swam away. I hope that fish lived. I, I don't know, uh, because... Tell me about it, dinner that night. Well, that night... Well, actually, Ralph got back in the boat, and he fished. We were taking turns. He fished now. He said, Stu, but, your turn, your turn but, to Paul? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, he didn't say that, but, yeah, it, but we knew. Yeah, sure. And, and he was so full of tarpon slime, he smelled like a cormorant. I had to keep him downwind right. all the time. I mean, he was, of course, he was wrapped around that fish. He was completely slimed. That night at dinner, he never said, neither one of us ever said anything about that. Oh, when Ralph got back in the boat, the only thing he did say, why did you run me over? And I said, Ralph, I didn't do it on purpose. Purpose, right. I was trying to, you know, and I explained it to him. Well, we didn't say a thing about, th about that catch. That night at dinner it never came into our conversation. Uh, the next day, out there all day, we each caught a couple of nice fish. And that night at dinner, excuse me, that night at dinner, uh, Ralph said, you know, how much do you think that fish really weighed? And I said, Ralph, and I took a paper napkin, tore it in half, threw half across the table to him with a pencil that was on the table. I said, you write down what you think it weighed, and I'll write down what I think it weighed. So we don't influence each other. He said, Stu, you've probably seen as many big tarpon as anybody in the world. I said, well, maybe, but you have to. So he wrote down 200 and, uh, 230 with a plus sign. I wrote down 230 PLUS. So we were both pretty right. pretty close on the side. And he was on that fish, wrapped around that fish. You guys, well. <coughs> and that was on 12-pound class tippet. If he had used my gaff either time, it would never come out of him. Had a barb, you know, and a big bite. It would have gone completely through 
the width of that fish. You know, regardless of what we do, what sports we participate in, it's, it's uh, woulda, shoulda, coulda so many times, you know, and that's just the way the, the, the lucky ball rolls. Sometimes it, it stops shy of going into the hole. Al Fluger Jr. named his boat, We Shoulda. What is, we yeah, should big big bold letters on the side of his boat. We should have. He should have torn the rearview mirror off that boat. <laughs> <laughs> the um, tell me about the down and dirty. I think um, you were the guy that really promoted uh, not only tarpon fishing but tarpon fishing and pulling aggressively. Tell me, you know that learning curve, and especially with the down and dirty. I even gave a down and dirty to a blue marlin. The, off of Mazatlan, Mexico, that was probably closer to 400 than it was 350. And that was on 6 kg, 17 pound tippet. And, well, well, explain what the down and dirty is. Okay. Uh, any fish that you hook is going to panic by being feeling the pressure and run. Now, if you're pulling up on the fish, like most people used to say, keep your rod tip up. You've heard that before. Right. Uh, if you do that when the fish is close by, you're not doing anything to the fish. It just sets its shoulders and does what it wants, especially a big fish. But it works also with permit, which are not long fish. Uh, you roll the fish down and under. It now, for the first time of its career in its life, has... Uh, been restricted from swimming. If you're pulling up on the fish, it doesn't get restricted, it still swims. But you pull down and it goes down, now it's being restricted actually from swimming. So back in the late 50s, uh, mid to late 50s, uh, I used to do a lot of fishing and catch a few fish, but uh, I just experimented on, on these things. Why? And how. Right. So. You know, it's interesting because I asked you one time when we were uh, filming for the show about 12 pounds. Because I've always figured in the tournaments that I was fishing in at the time, the Golden Fly was a 20-pound test. Initially, uh, the Gold Cup was 16 and the Holly was 12. And I always thought, you know, if I could learn how to pull 12 pounds of pressure uh, on that fish, that fish is going to be subdued quite quickly. So what I did... Uh, I got the pulley, a pulley system, which I've, I've shown seen you. It. you bet. And I learned, I leaned back and I learned what 12 pounds of resistance is in my hand. So I could sit in my, and be at my, in my garage, drink a beer, smoke a cigar, hang, listen to some music, and really memorize and have my, my hands understand what 12 pounds of resistance is like with that fly rod in my hand. And I asked you, I said, Stu, I put a scale out. I don't know if you remember in your backyard here. Attach the scale to the butt section of the leader. I said, uh, show me 12 pounds, because you always spoke about 12. And you bent that rod and went right to 12. And that's when I realized that you could learn what 12 was so quickly because you were hooking so <coughs> many fish that, that you learned what 12 pound of pressure was by breaking fish off sure. and hooking fish. But my contention was, in this day and age, how many people have a chance to hook a fish? Not many, but once you hook that fish, if you know how to pull on a fish, you have a chance of catching that fish. But the important thing is being smooth. Right. You know, uh, I take people in with, with a, a Chatillion scale. We used to use uh, now a uh, Boga grip. Yeah, a Boga grip. Right. Uh, and back them off 100 feet or 50 feet, and I say, now... Try and try and break that, or, or you can't break it. You cannot. If you if you have a slight bend in that rod and you're smooth, it is almost impossible. That's right. And especially what's interesting too, Stu, is that with the pulley system, I have twelve pound barbell, and I stand back there and I show people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you try to set the hook with a rod tip, you can rip on that rod as hard as you want, and you're not even going to budge that twelve yep. pound barbell. But if you have the, you know, you strip strike, you get, you know, the weight of the fish in your left hand, the stripping hand, you have the rod up against your waist. And now you, you step back and lean back and use the butt of the rod. Now you obviously can seat that hook. Yeah, I do it as a combination. Yeah, it's a strip strike type of thing. But 
uh, it's interesting how much how important scales are to show people what they're talking about. And I've always known that if you tell an angler that is not really astute to pull harder, what do they do? They just, yeah, uh, you know what they do. They, so they they get the rod bent, pull harder. They just lean back and pull harder in this position. They have no idea about reeling down and straightening the rod exactly. and lift with the butt. Yep. But it's kind of interesting. You spoke about the down and dirty. I knew that a long time ago when I first started to hear about Stu Apton pulling on fish. But I never really have heard anybody other than you just talk about that term, teach how to pull on fish. Have you? Uh, not really. Not really. Not no, really. People no, don't teach that. No. Uh, and that's one of my strong suits on teaching. Right. Uh, in, in Cuba... They were calling me the professor. Right. <laughs> professor. We, yeah. We call you that here, too. <laughs> <laughs> because I would take the guides after a day of fishing, get the guides together to teach them what they should be doing. Right. You know, with their clients. They didn't know. They didn't. You know, uh, like a guy from uh, North Dakota that I had down there with a bunch of us one time uh, fought a tarpon. I forgot how long it was now. I think it was four and a half hours. Right, right. And it was only about an eight, 75, 80 pound fish. Right. And 20 pound test. Yeah, 20 pound <laughs> test. <laughs> That's and, a classic example of, of what we're talking about. And he just was never bending more than the tip. And the guide would not go with the fish. I mean, the fish was out there hundreds of yards most of the time you know what i you know i find this when i travel the world i see a lot of lazy guides out there <laughs> you're right because if their client is hooked up to a fish they don't have to pull we're already hooked up it helps them make the day yeah. that's right i agree cerveza uh siesta manana <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <Si como no. laughs> how how important was it for you and what kind of pride did you have with your fame Oh, gosh, I don't know how to even answer that because I, pride comes with happenings. Uh, doing something well. Yes, doing, you're right. And you did everything perfectly. No, no. Or perfect, I, I did in an airplane. <laughs> uh, in my quest for, no, no, I'm trying to think, in my tarpon country DVD. Right. Uh Flip Pallet and I, and uh, I have a, a big tarpon on in Sandy Key Basin, and I knew it was a tentative record. I'm fishing 12 pound. I knew it was a tentative record, and the fish surged, and I didn't go with it and broke it off, and we come in, Flip says, right, break right in the tip, at night, uh, perfect break, and I said, 12 pounds, only 12 pounds. Right. <laughs> Tell me the uh, time in the Lord Keys when uh, when somebody says, who do you think you are? <laughs> that's, that's a good story. I love this one. You know, that's that's the lead lead chapter in my Stu Apps, uh What the heck is the name of my last book? <laughs> of Winds and Tide? No. No. Oh, long stories uh, told yeah. short. Yeah, long stories told short. Uh, that's that's the lead chapter. Uh, uh, f oh, let me think for a second. I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, the guy on the board of directors of BTT from Chicago. He's a real estate broker. Bert Sherb. Bert Sherb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bert had been a fundraiser for for me when I was a vice president of the Everglades Protection Association. I'd go up to Chicago. He'd have a bunch of people into his house, big money people, and they would come away with big funds for the, the organization. Well, we did the same thing for BTT. Now, one evening he calls me. He says, Stu, I've got a, a gentleman up here that's willing to pay $20,000 to BTT to go tarpon fishing for his first time with Stu App. I said, done deal. You know, of course, we'll do that. 
Well, we set up the trip, and Bert's down here too, and uh, we left from my house right here and ran out to Tavernier Key. I'd been fishing out there. It was in April, and the fish were westbound, southbound, people would say, uh, and I had them pretty well pegged. We left the house here in the boat in the black dark. I wanted to make sure that I got this spot, and we did and uh, got the boat staked. Now, this guy had been a trout fisherman somewhat, but had never had a 12-weight rod in his hands to even look at. So I had a casting deal with him. I got him finally casting maybe 40 feet, and uh, I knew the fish would be coming by somewhere around that, that range. Well, he hooks a few fish and never gets the hook set in him. Another boat, meanwhile, has come up and got on another big chunk of white sand beyond where we were, uh, out off of Tavernier Key. It's, that's where we were. And uh, after about six or seven fish, we were there for a while, uh, this guy pulls up his anchor where he was in the other spot, and motors right down next to us, right directly in front of me, uh, a roll cast away, cutting off my flow of fish from the direction the fish were traveling from. And Bert says, God, I can't, I can't, I can't believe that. I said, neither can I. I said, we're going to just have to get up there and visit with him. So I pull up my anchor. Because white sand bottom, you can't stake out. You wanted to be right in that one spot. And I pulled up to him. I said, excuse me, sir. Uh, I don't know if that's your son in the boat, uh, but you're showing him things that are not really done here, right? not nice, not polite, what you've just done cutting off my flow of fish. And he said, oh, I've fished with lots of guides here in the Keys. They all do that. I said, name one. And he said, well, I can't think of their names right now. Uh, then he went on and on and on. I said, well, you're not teaching your son the right, the right thing to do. Right. Yeah. And uh, he says, well, I said, I've been, he said, well, I've been fishing here in the Keys for, for 10 years or five years. I forgot how many really. And I said, well, I've been here for more than 30 or 40. And he said, well, who the hell do you think you are, Sue App? <laughs> And, and I said, that's exactly who I am. That's my name. And he looked at me, shook his head, didn't say another word, reached down, pulled up his anchor, fired up his engine, and idled out of there and left. Over the horizon. He Over was. the horizon. <laughs> Good for you. What did it mean to you have uh, your tarpon fly uh, become a U.S. postage stamp? <laughs> that was a fun I mean, it's pretty cool, right? That was 1991. That was very, that was a... Uh, unusual happening. It happened during, actually, first time I saw one was during the Holly tournament. And I didn't fish the tournaments anymore. Uh, in 91, I, I was out of that stuff. Uh, they, uh, at the midweek, they would always have a cocktail party and a gathering, and they invited me to be there. And during the 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 happening and visiting with people and all. Somebody said, hey, I hear you got your flying name on a U.S. postage stamp. <laughs> I laughed. I said, sure, and it's going to snow here in the Keys in an hour. And he said, no, really. Actually, it wasn't. It was a, it was a, a lady that was saying it, and I didn't believe it. Uh, but the next day, I went to the post office in Almorada. Sure enough, they had them. <laughs> how did how'd that get to be? I have no idea. Have no idea. I mean, idea. just out of nowhere, your fly is now a U.S. postage stamp. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. Yep. And it was an artist's tell rendition. Me you want a res tell me you want a residual on <laughs> all those stamps. <laughs> it was an artist's rendition of it. And I guess he liked the colors. But, you know, that orange and yellow fly has probably caught more record tarpon than any other individual pattern, fly pattern. Well, you had a great, you had a lot of innovations. <laughs> what were you most proud of, of all those? You know, you, the, the insert in the rod, yeah, well, flies, the, you know, it, you know how to fight fish, 
teasing billfish. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, there's yeah, so uh, many books written about all of your expertise and knowledge. It's crazy. I was lucky enough to catch the very first Pacific sailfish ever on a fly. Uh, J. Lee Cuddy had caught an Atlantic sail on fly. Uh, a month before I caught that Pacific, which was, is that right? So yeah. you get there. Uh, what, where was Robinson in this well, time frame? He didn't catch any sailfish. Uh, what was he catching? Marlin, striped marlin. Oh, I thought he was a sailfish guy. Interesting. No. So this record, or this marlin you have on your wall? No, no, it's a sailfish. Or it's that sailfish is still a record. It's a oh, hundred thirty yeah. pound sailfish on twelve pound. Hundred thirty six pounds on twelve on twelve pound class tippet. Which had a break under twelve, right? You know, six k, uh, uh, kgs. Yeah, six kg is actually thirteen and three quarter pounds, just like uh, uh, eight kg is actually almost eighteen, nineteen pounds. Right. Not sixteen pound like people say. Uh, Ten kg is twenty three pounds. You know. Right. Uh, but people say, oh, 20 pound uh, <laughs> sounds better than than 23 pound test. Right, right, right. So it's kind of like a deceiving thing. Well, yes and no. Uh, I've got, I had a line tester, leader tester. I worked for the DuPont company for a number of years as their sole fishing consultant. And one of the things they did for me is they made a line tester for me so I could test my leaders. But what I would do, I used the same kind of leader material all the time, and I would mic it. I have Ames micrometers. Right. Uh, and all I would have to do is, is the same kind of leader material is mic it, and I know how to test. There were not many guys doing that kind of sophisticated uh, research and intelligence back in that day that era i mean there are some guys now doing it but that was a long time ago that you were doing that oh yeah that that was back in the late 60s right so is, is there one of these innovations that stand out that you did that you're most proud of what i'm most proud of is marrying my wife really i mean she's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my whole life really good for you uh i'm serious uh, and that always pops into my head when people want to know my best thing. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, well, let me tell you. I well, aside from your bride. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. Tell me about the time you were at your darkest uh, point when you were talking about, you know, where you wanted to go. I think we spoke about that at one time when you were so When upset. I had a three fifty seven Magnum in my mouth? Yeah, tell me about that. Uh, after being married for 33 years... After spending more than half my life with a gal, uh, and she's divorcing me, that was, uh, and you know about that, and uh, that was the worst that I can remember. I couldn't envision life without her after spending more than half my life with her. And uh, I was just going to forget it all and end it all. And something stopped me. I'm a, I'm a survivor. You liked what you had going forward yeah, more than you had going to the dark but, side. But actually, it was the best thing that ever happened to me, that divorce. I never would have met Janine. And she is, seriously, the best thing that ever happened to me. And everybody that knows her don't understand how she can put up with me. <laughs> but, you know, that's why we all love her so much, because we love you. <laughs> and when I first uh, met you... Shortly thereafter, we were coming here having rum dum dummies, or what do you what do you call rum dum boogie punch? That's right. And uh, she was coming across the street, and you were so, you were glo you were a glow. You were so happy. Well, you're ninety now. What's the next phase for you with fishing and what you have here in the Keys? You just sold your place in Montana. Yeah, you know, uh, I was really, really planning on having my ninetieth birthday in Cuba, fishing. And uh, they have a couple of really nice lodges that have it all when you when you're there. And I was I had picked a time when the tarpon would be in there, and those tarpon are like the tarpon used to be in the Keys. Uh, you put a fly 
anywhere near the right place. It doesn't have to be the right place. Right. And they eat it. Well, <clears throat> well, uh, because of uh, political things right now with the U.S. and Cuba, that's all off. And I, my second choice was here in the Keys at Chica Lodge. And we're having a fun tournament. It's a fun tournament where the anglers, normal anglers' wives and children should be fishing. Everybody's going to be on the water. That's, that's right. For one day, uh, and it's going to be for all the species of fish, uh, snappers, ladyfish, and so on. And there's negative points and positive points. Now, uh, bonefish and permit and tarpon, you get the most points. Uh, snook the next most and redfish the next but snappers and jack crevel and ladyfish are all points but they're also negative points if while you're casting near the mangroves you hook the mangroves uh you have negative points if you break off your your leader and leave the the fly there or lure uh it's more negative points if you hook your guide it's great negative Dis- points. Disqualification. <laughs> <laughs> and if, if you have another angler fly fishing in a boat with you and you tangle with lines with him, it's negative. It's, it's a fun happening. For sure. And For sure. It's all going to be written up within, within the next month. It'll be all in writing. Well, it's going to be a great celebration. Um, Excuse me. But, yeah, now that you mentioned that, uh, that night... Uh, there will be an awards presentation. I have to speak to a bunch of manufacturers and get some awards for the anglers that, that win prizes. Sure. And, uh, <clears throat> and then it'll be a birthday party at the same time. And there's no charge for this, for the tournament or the birthday party at Chica. I'm, I'm donating $10,000. I have some other people going to be doing almost like wise because chica is very expensive and they really put out a good humongous spread they do fantastic so i'm looking for more help more help well we're, we're gonna find it for you Stu. um in parting how would you like to be remembered i remember i asked you this question a long time ago and i remember the way you answered it god was so much better than anything i could say i yeah you know as a nice guy And I told you, Stu, I said, yes, Stu, you are a nice guy and a whole lot more. (laughs) That's right. Well, it's great having you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I love you. I love you too, buddy. And let's go fishing together. That would be great.